Yeah, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank the uh, Pattern Institute and Satish Uncle for you know inviting me to be part of this very August gathering. It's a very different audience to what we are used to, so a very good mixture. So thanks again for the invitation. Uh, though I'm primarily a clinical neurologist, I have a, a great interest in cognitive neurology, which is a field that is up and coming and which I'm sure most of you will be hearing about it over the next few years. So uh, I'll give you a small outline into cognitive neurology and how patterns are formed in the brain, which is of great relevance to the Pattern Institute. So I'll just run through a few slides because it will work out too long otherwise. I have structured my talk into a small introduction and then uh, cognitive development and the brain, looking at the epigenetic influences, a small look into myelination and neurogenesis and uh, the last part of the talk will be a little bit to do about how you can improve your memory and mind and improve your neuroplasticity with regards to children, young adults and even something for the elderly. So, uh, uh, what exactly is this cognitive neurology or cognitive neuroscience? So, it has to do basically with the scientific process that underlie or the biological process that underlie cognition. So, we all know about cognition. What happens in the brain that will affect the cognition? That is the study of cognitive neurology. So, uh, it has its origins in history from the works of Vesalius and uh, the first part of cognitive neurology was called phrenology or basically lumps and bumps in the brain. So I can see this is an old phrenology where you divide the brain into different areas which they postulated each area will look after each part of the brain or functions of the brain. This is obviously out of date but uh, the neuropsychology was the first pre-runner of cognitive neurology especially through the works of two people, Wernicke and Broca whose name continues to be famous even today in the field of stroke. So they identified certain parts of the brain that control our language and when these parts of the brain are affected we have a condition where there is an inability to speak that is called aphasia. So this aphasia is named even now so many centuries later after Wernicke and Broca. So this is the area Broca's area which is deals with the speaking of language and the Wernicke's area deals with the understanding. So if you don't have understanding and don't have production you cannot have speech. So this is the pioneer of or the pioneers of cognitive neurology. And then of course 20th century came the advent of the functional MRI, functional neuroimaging and now it, cognitive neurology has become a very vast subject. It has multiple inputs like the sensory input, language, thought, learning and perception. So all these together forms a core subject of cognitive neurology and this is the basis of all pattern formation in the brain. So uh, this is of course what we all wish. Brains are awesome, but unfortunately not everyone has a good one. So when you look at the development of the brain in early life, you, here this is the age and this is the process of development. So one thing you can see very clearly, most of the development is complete by around children between you know 6, 12 years of age. So the majority of the development takes place even during fetal life, goes on till infancy and the growing brain, most of the things are complete by say 10 years of age. Why is this important? Catch the children young. So the age at which the brain is amenable to external influences will be between say infancy and 11 or 10, 15 years of age. So this is the time you have to catch the children. And that is why I think the Pattern Institute, the work they do will be of great relevance to us. Now why is this important? Because the child's brain has what is called plasticity. What is plasticity? It is the ability of the brain to change with regard to external influences. So, for example, what this can be as later previously said in the form of genetic expression or nature or environmental influences and nurture. So it's basically, it's not nature versus nurture, it's nature and nurture. So uh, what are some of these influencing factors? I'll go into detail in that, but uh, some of the important factors are environmental factors include socioeconomic status, nutrition, interaction, pollution even. So here you can see that as your socioeconomic status improves, the growth of the brain is more. So that's one of the factors. So uh, before going on to the factors, there is an important field which I want all of you to know, which is called epigenetics, which is becoming very important today. What exactly is epigenetics? Epigenetics is a new branch of science that basically focus on, focuses on how your environment, your thoughts and your experiences affect your expression of genes. 
So previously it was thought that all of us have a genetic code, so 46 chromosomes. Those will determine all your characteristics, including your behavior, your appearance. This is proven to be not entirely true. And this is where epigenetics plays an important. So epigenetics basically means that your environmental influences and your thoughts can play a role in shaping your future. So how does this take place? So epigenetics changes your phenotype without actually changing your DNA. So your genetic code remains the same, but the expression of it varies. And this is why this is very important. So, uh, and uh, what is important is these epigenetic changes are passed on to future generations. So it's not confined to that particular person. It can be passed on to future generations. And that is the phenomenon of inherited legacy. How do these modifications take place? So I just, this is a, I know it's a complicated diagram. Bear with me for a second. This is our genetic code. And you can see there are certain parts of the code here underlying in red. These are areas which are inactive. So this is the active part. These areas are inactive and they are hidden. This is a normal genetic code. Now certain environmental factors act or epigenetic factors come and attach to this part which is called a histone. So when it attaches here, this part which is hidden spreads out and you know this part of the DNA which is not seen previously will become exposed. So all human beings have certain parts of genetic code which are not expressed. But when you have certain environmental factors, those factors will become expressed. So that is how your environment can actually change your genetic makeup without actually changing the code. It just helps hidden parts of the genetic code to be expressed. So this is why it's, uh, certain factors like diet, physical activity, you know, uh, exposure to toxins like alcohol, all of these can affect how your genetic code is expressed. So this is what uh, the this is the positive effect of a positive genes, and this is the effective of a negative experiences. So your environmental exposure plays a big role in how your genes are expressed. So genes load the gun, but the environment pulls the trigger. So it's a combination of both. So uh, epigenetics says that genes are not your destiny, but epigenetics also says that your foreparents' diet has doomed you. So it's just a paradox. So why is this important? Well, you may ask, why, why do we have to learn about epigenetics? This is because children's development is what makes epigenetics so important. One, uh, I'll tell you a very interesting thing. You must have all seen identical twins. So ch children who are twins, they have the same genetic code. There is absolutely no difference. Yet, when they grow up, you can see a lot of differences in their behavior and their uh, you know, uh, characteristics. So you may ask, why is this so? When you have a same genetic code, you will express, uh, expect them to have the very similar traits. This is because of epigenetics. So that is one clear example in nature of how epigenetics varies the code. So that is why children who have positive experiences in childhood will uh, you know, tend to have a positive, more positive outcome, whereas those who have uh, negative influences will tend to have a slightly negative outcome. So, uh, development of brain architecture is what makes epigenetics very important. So, these are some of the things by which you can influence your epigenetics. So, healthy diet, exercise, uh, avoiding exposure to pollution, uh, and I, I'll come to that measures a little later on. So, uh, another part of it is myelination. So, as you all know, myelin is the covering of the brain, and uh, so, why is this so important? Uh, myelination is important because the transport of signals throughout the brain happens through the myelinated neuron. So, if you want your memory and thought process to be fast, you need a uh, myelination to be complete and practical. So, there is a big link. Uh, many studies have shown a significant link between the extent of myelination and your cognitive abilities, including your development of language, memory, processing speed and your reactivity to, reactivity to external stimuli. So myelination starts right from fetus, from the uh, child uh, from at birth to at least uh, maximum of uh, one year is when most of the myelin tracks get completed. But this can sometimes go on to little later on also. Why is this important? The extent of myelination will determine your processing speed. What is this processing speed? It is the speed by which children will process information. So you must have seen certain children able to adapt and assimilate things much quicker, whereas certain children it takes a little longer time. One such cause of the reason for this could be the extent of myelination. So uh, another thing along with myelination is synaptogenesis. So synapses are basically connections between the neurons. As uh, 
Dr. Satish Sankar was telling that you have a lot of neurons which establish connections between various uh, areas. So that myelination and synaptogenesis is also something which continues through childhood and into adult life. And this is a very important thing. Synaptic or synaptic pruning. So, so you know, all know pruning is basically you get rid of things which are not required. Weeding or whittling. What is this pruning? So synaptic pruning takes place in the child between say 10 to 15 or 10 to 18 years of age. The brain has a lot of neurological connections, some of which may not be very important. So by this process of synaptic pruning, the brain will get rid of those connections which are not being used. So for example, you don't use a particular part of the brain enough, those will be eliminated during this process of synaptic pruning. On the other hand, if you use those areas more, those areas will be retained. So that is the importance of synaptic pruning. So uh, when you have a lot of early positive experiences, including visual, uh, hearing and tactile stimulation, this allows more and more synapses to be preserved. And when these synapses are preserved, they are not eliminated during the pruning phase. So that is why more and more stimuli in early age is very, very important. And one of the most important stimuli for synaptic growth is music, as has been told in the previous talk. So music is something which promotes synaptogenesis and uh, during, especially during the time of pruning. So this is synaptic pruning. So you have this number of synapses at birth. By around 7 to 8 years of age, the child has around so many millions of neurons and synapses. This will get cut down, cut down, cut down between say 10 and 15 years of age. So the ones you use will be retained, the ones you don't use will be discarded. And that is why the final state will be attained around 15 to 16 years of age. So this pruning is uh, very important in this respect. Now another important role is sleep. You may ask what is the connection between sleep and neurons? That is in the field of memory. Sleep is the single most important factor which leads to consolidation of memory. It is not enough to just store memory, you have to retain and consolidate it. So this consolidation of memories takes place especially in the part of the brain which is called the hippocampus which is uh, near the temporal lobe. And this hippocampal consolidation of memories takes place only during sleep. That is why sleep plays a very important role if you want to retain things for a long period of time. And it is very well known that deprivation of sleep can have adverse effect on memory and learning. So importance of sleep in adults and in children, very, very important. This is a, just a schematic which shows sleep has two phases. I'm sure some of, most of you will know. There is a REM sleep and an NREM sleep. Both of them are important for memory and it has been found that NREM sleep has importance in synaptic communication and REM sleep in strengthening of cortical representation. This is just scientific jargon. Basically it shows that sleep is important for consolidation of memory. And the last part of the scientific thing is neurogenesis. Neurogenesis, we have all been taught that neurons do not reproduce. So nerve cells don't reproduce and what you are born with is what you have. However, this is also uh, proven to be false now. Uh, neurogenesis has been proven to be there even in adults. So uh, previously it was thought that adult brain is not plastic. Once it gets injured, that's it. You are, now it's not going to come back. It has been proven in research that there are some areas of the brain that have neurogenic zones. These zones can actually derive or lay growth to new neurons. So these zones are basic. There are two main zones which are called neurogenic niches. So uh, the main one for us is the hippocampus, which is also the site of memory. So this is important. The site of memory is also a site where new neurons can happen. And this neurogenic genesis can happen even up to adulthood. So this is a new discovery. And the other area is the uh, SVZ, other subventricular zone, which is not so important. I think the hippocampus is something which all of you should know. So it's a site for memory and it's also a site for new neuron formation. Uh, so this is a... Uh, this addition of new neurons in the hippocampus will promote memory and learning in human beings. So uh, what are some things which can modulate this new neurons? You may ask what causes these new neurons to come? So there are various uh, things which can have a trophic effect or a positive effect. One of these is learning skills. So try to learn more and more new skills. This will definitely have a, or some sort of a mental training which can improve your hippocampal volume. And the other two important things are music. So we keep on repeating the same thing. Musical training is the single most important factor that leads to new neuron formation in the hippocampus. 
So this can improve your memory and as uh, already pointed out, can improve your IQ. One reason for this improvement in IQ may be because of addition of new neurons in the hippocampus. So music, especially in the hippocampus. And the other thing which can improve is, this is just a schematic of how music improves the brain. Which So basically it can have effect on all the parts of the brain. In the frontal lobe, it can improve your uh, volume of white matter, improving speech, temporal lobe improvement of memory. This part, basal ganglia is the one which contains your uh, skills. So like learning to drive, uh, you know, that sort of learned skills, music can improve these connections also. Parietal lobe has to do with uh, memory and higher functions. Occipital lobe with vision and cerebellum with balance. So all of these music is, has a positive effect on this. And another thing is meditation. So uh, the other uh, second or third factor that improves your neuro, new, promotes new neuron formation is meditation which again involves the hippocampus so uh, learning new skills musical training and meditation so uh, the just one line on what is neuroplasticity so uh, plasticity is basically the idea that experiences can change our brains uh, the, our brain is not limited it depends to what extent you use it and how you can change a part of the brain so i think uh, this is just a schematic and a wonderful article from Katsulis et al. I just took this diagram. So it's basically teaching a new drug, old tricks, and rewiring the brain. So what it means, neuroplasticity in a nutshell is learn new skills and new thoughts. They will carve out new pathways in the brain. You keep on repeating those pathways. Repetition and frequent practice will consolidate those pathways. And old pathways will get used less and less as you consolidate the new pathways. So with repeated attention towards a change, you are basically rewiring or putting a new part of the brain. So with practice, you can actually rewire your brain. And one very good experiment which I found very fascinating is people were divided into two groups. One group practiced piano for two hours every day for one week. The second group did not practice it. They just imagined practicing with the without actually using the hands, but imagining that they are actually playing the piano. And what is significantly uh, what is interesting is that the first group, the motor cortex, this is the area which controls your motor movement, which is found in the frontal lobe. That part of the brain which involves the hands had increased in size in the first group, those who had actually done the piano. But even more surprising is those who, sorry, those who actually did not practice but had imagined practicing it, even in those patients you found that, or those subjects you found that the cortex had in, uh, increased in size. So it's not just action alone, even the thought of it can actually impact your brain, which I found quite uh, significant. So practice, practice and practice, so you can change your brain. So uh, set goals, make decisions and you know, you can create new pathways. It's a very good uh, article from Katsu, which I'll advise all of you to go through it. Uh, so this is basically just training the brain. So uh, the last part of the talk, I just want to highlight a few methods to increase your neuroplasty, especially in youngsters. What are some of the things which we as neurologists can advise? So one is of course your diet, uh, avoiding processed and refined foods, improving uh, your diet, uh, using vitamin supplements. Uh, secondly, as I already told, the role of sleep, Get a, ensure you get a good night's sleep. And this is very important. This is what we are advised nowadays. Uh, afternoon nap, if possible, of around 20 minutes will definitely elevate your neuroplasticity potential further. I'm not asking all of you to take nap in the working hours, but as far as feasible, this is excellent for improving your neuroplasticity. Uh, and it improves the dendritic neurons, as uh, he was telling you. The dendritic and spinal neurons will increase when you do this afternoon nap. Uh, don't let your work day linger, especially for the software professionals. Uh, leave on time. Uh, you know, don't stick on when it is not needed and putting a stop to stresses of the day. The message, taking take home message should be, it's okay to stop work when you are done. Expand your vocabulary. So try to learn a new word, if possible, a new language, which will improve your uh, language areas. Use your weak hand. This is very important. We are in many of the neurological conditions like stroke and you know, writer's cramp. We advise the patient to start using your non-dominant hand. Most of us are left uh, right-handed. so. Try to use your left hand for common things. It will definitely help you. Uh, set micro goals. Don't put very large goals. Break it down into small goals. Uh, exercise, of course. 
it goes without saying uh, exercise will definitely improve your neuroplasticity uh, travel musical instruments learning to play a new instrument and avoiding procrastination of course uh, to form a new habit research has shown it takes any anywhere between 18 and 254 days so uh, it, uh, habit formation involves two processes one is your conscious decision making that is in your prefrontal cortex now conscious making you keep on practicing that habit and after it after a certain period of time the habit will become unconscious it becomes second nature to you that is when the basal ganglia takes over so our aim should be to practice something so much that it becomes second nature to us so this is, this is these are just the things like uh, keeping a journal meditation exercise limiting screen time etc and developing new skills so uh, all individuals have a particular skill set which are we used to perform a job well so you can include the setting a career goal getting a mentor if you can get a good mentor to help you with work and somebody who provides you with constructive criticism it will definitely help reading books sticking by schedules uh, regular practice asking for feedback and learning from other people's experiences be it good or bad all of these will help you in developing new skills and uh, in elderly people i get often asked get asked this question that how can we prevent dementia or can we prevent the aging uh, it's you cannot prevent it of course but there are certain steps which you can postpone it or delay it or even uh, prevent it to a certain extent these of course most important is exercise uh, exercise will lead to a uh, release of a factor which is called BDNF or brain derived neurotropic factor which actually can help to improve your brain volume so that is something 30 minutes of exercise moderate exercise daily mental exercises this is what we advise all our patients with dementia especially Alzheimer dementia uh, to use play games like crossword sudoku uh, join a book club uh, adequate sleep of course uh, encourage social interactions smoking which can affect uh, the memory and of course treat all your associated conditions it's not enough to just do all these things if you have an associated condition like diabetes or hypertension please treat it because that can lead itself lead to a worsening of memory use cues around the house so many people are elderly they are get confused due to lack of proper lighting and proper cues so and then maintaining a diary something which the elderly brains will definitely benefit from new language may be a little difficult so and last part of the talk is caring for the developing brain in children what are the measures you can actually take uh, part in children so uh, as i already told childhood is a phase where the new networks develop so it's already been uh, covered so the brain thinks that it's the most important organ so play uh, children playing is a wonderful way to help the baby or the child develop uh, you know uh, play along with the child participate in the child's play also uh, comfort so uh, for babies the touch of the parents will definitely help reading uh, encourage reading in the children especially you know uh, repeating repeating the same books further and you know ask him or her to point to certain parts of the book where certain images so that is another way uh, choosing the toys that certain toys will be a little more challenging to the child and you can choose those things like one example here is the stacking of the blocks what you call the Jenga game so there you encourage the child to stack blocks such that they do not fall down and that's a very good way to develop the child's social and motor fine motor skills also so choose the games don't just buy random games choose what games they play make your children help out in chores at home and may encourage them to be part of that process so uh, when they put the toys out on the floor make sure that they keep it back so and uh, these are things which you can uh, sorting the toys into categories cleaning up after play these things which are we i think all of us can adopt listening to music of course uh, nutrition limiting junk food which is unfortunately easier said than done uh, and so this, this is just a synopsis of the things that one can do basically what i've told before so uh, just to summarize the you know it's a complicated topic just to put it all in one piece so uh, cognitive neurosciences like i told it's improving and increasing uh, the role is improving in daily life uh, there is an association between myelination and the speed or the processing speed epigenesis the most important part of today's talk so epigenetic changes environmental changes they can lead to your change in your approach and your future without actually changing the genetic code synaptic pruning and synaptogenesis 
the pathways you use more will be preserved the pathways you use less will be lost so try to use more and more pathways sleep get a good night sleep for consolidation of memory uh, remember the role of hippocampus both as a site of new neurons as well as a seat of memory neuroplasticity improve your skills both in adults and in elderly and certain methods to improve the brain in children of course this this is a very up and coming topic uh, i have been doing research into it frankly only after uh, he told uh, this topic was given to me and as i learned read more and more it's fascinating to us and the more research is definitely needed in this and to know how the patterns in the brain are built it's a fascinating topic so remember the brain is one of the most wonderful organs and try to uh, re realize its potential over a period of time so thank you for the patient listening